It's a traditional Japanese structure in what's called shōenzukuri, or scholar's desk style. It's really considered to be quintessential Japanese architecture, and the reason that it's here in Philadelphia was actually this particular structure was built in the early 1950s in Nagoya, Japan. So it was part of an exhibition that the Museum of Modern Art in New York put together. Called so it was moved here? Or it no? was moved here. Okay. So this house has been moved three times. Wow. Yeah. In <laughs> so, pieces, I would imagine. In pieces. Yeah. In pieces and crates. And part of the reason that's possible is because it's put together all with joinery. Yeah. So it's, it's like not... It's a big puzzle piece. It's a big puzzle yeah. piece, but it allows it to be... Dismantled. Dismantled. Yeah, that's great. Brought from location to location. And it also allows it to be repaired. Uh, over time, so you know, if there's a if there's a building in Japan that's like 1,000 plus years old, that doesn't mean that the entire structure is 1,000 years old in the Western sense. Uh, in terms of you know, this building hasn't been touched and it just like turns into ruin. It could look perfectly new, and it's because it just has this continuous upkeep, and the, the joinery allows that to happen. Forgive me, because you mentioned that this is traditional Japanese architecture, and mm -hmm. I know that there is, I don't know if the architecture is the same way as gardens, but like there's certain gardens that came from certain periods in absolutely. Japanese history. Is that the same way with like architecture Absolutely, as well? absolutely. Okay. So anyone can kind of choose like what they consider to be the quintessential, but the idea of this particular house was that the Museum of Modern Art was putting on a exhibition to show really modern architecture from around the world. And the other entries, you know, were just like someone from Denmark showing like the latest glass um, building or something. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. They wanted to do something from Japan, so they actually picked a contemporary architect, Junzo Yoshimura, who was kind of like an up and coming architect in Japan at the time. But him coming from his background and having the respect for the traditional architecture that he was so fond of, he said, you know what, like, I think that we should make something completely traditional, and he like almost wanted to like absolve his own authorship. We'll go into that a little bit more, but mm -hmm. because he did take some authority over the site and making specific specific decisions uh, to his taste, but really he he said, you know what, like Frank Lloyd Wright has gotten like famous off of some of these ideas that we've been doing for hundreds and hundreds of years, mm -hmm. and. They believed that you know this particular style of architecture embodied something totally timeless, completely classical, but also very forward thinking. So they submitted a piece of basically 95% to spec Shōenzukuri architecture for the Museum of Modern Art's Modern Architecture exhibit. So it was like kind of a conceptual art piece in and of itself, conceptual art decision to do that. Right. So you had asked about gardens being, you know, going through different time periods and different styles, and like that's absolutely true for the architecture as well. Um, what's interesting about Shōenzukuri is that like, I think the reason that Junzo Yoshimura and the people at the Museum of Modern Art chose this particular style is because it was kind of the first time that Japan like fully divorced itself from the like original kind of like Chinese architecture influence and 
the decisions that were made in the style, in the level of detailing, were really coming from like a specifically Japanese and really like Zen Buddhist uh, sentiment. And that's a really important point that you're making there because mm -hmm. I think a lot of folks don't realize that much of the early gardens were influenced by Chinese. Yeah, right? absolutely, and absolutely. And then it started to have its own sentiment and, and uh, point of view after yeah. a while. And, th and so there's a real clear bifurcation there. And again, you're saying this more in the architecture point, but mm -hmm. in gardens as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I mean, right, in terms of the gardens, it's probably somewhere around like the fifth century. Uh, Chinese culture, Chinese gardens, you know, made their presence known in Japan. Mm -hmm. um, and the very early Japanese gardens from that time period were really kind of like emulating those early Chinese gardens. But, you know, they had different materials at hand. They had their own uh, sentiments going into it. So over time, it kind of continues evolving, continues evolving in its own style um, to touch on points that are, you know, were important to the Japanese people at the time. and. You know, you leave that in the blender for like a thousand years and then you get something like very, very idiosyncratic. Yeah. So I'm yeah, curious, yeah. was this architecture, this mm -hmm. building, mm -hmm. was it placed in the garden or was this, did this start the garden? Okay. You know what I mean? Wonderful question. <laughs> and the reason we're doing the garden tour from inside of the house yeah. is because those divisions between architecture, between gardening, between art in Japan are like not as linear. So people that are, you know, true students of any of those particular fields are all very much interested in the other pieces in, in tea ceremony and flower arrangement, yeah, architecture. One of the big differences I think that is important to talk about when you're thinking about kind of Japanese gardens, what they are, what they mean, is that the very beginnings of them really are a cultural experience and like a religious and spiritual experience from the very get-go. So I mentioned the fifth century influence from China, but in ancient Japan, there was also a history of, um, you know, local religion, Shinto, finding uh, places in nature that felt spiritually emboldened, felt the presence of kami spirits mm -hmm. there. And really it was just about the very first gardens, you could say, were um, just beautiful spaces that were kind of cleared of debris. So like a, an amazing boulder in the middle of a forest, a, a waterfall, a very, very old tree and the area would just kind of be cleaned up and demarcated as a special place, and that was really kind of the true like first garden. So even from that kind of primordial beginning, when the Chinese influence comes, it's not falling on a blank slate. I so. think they're like almost equivalent, and you mm -hmm. can correct me if you think I'm wrong, but like in some indigenous cultures here, they might say that's a sacred space. Mm -hmm. You know, so in, I feel like in Japanese culture, you know, anything that has been, you know, touched by a master artisan or anything has that kami, that spirit, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you could see that in the landscape and you could see that is beautiful. So you're saying that they found something that was like, almost like iconic or spiritually beautiful and they kind of like massaged it around it in a way yeah. and said, oh, look at that. You know, Absolutely. That is something that I could celebrate. And another thing that you're, you said that really struck me is that you know, oftentimes when we when we go to school, we're going to be like, oh, I'm going to be a landscape designer, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or I'm going to be an architect. Mm -hmm. But here, it's just blended because it's part of a, a cultural, spiritual life experience, mm -hmm. in a way. Mm -hmm. And they all they all evolved so much together. Mm -hmm. Specifically, thinking of Ashikaga Yoshi Yoshimasa from the 15th century. You know, he was one of the shoguns of Japan, and he built a, a building uh, similar to this called the Silver Pavilion, Ginkakuji. And at that time, he spent most of his time surrounding himself with, with artists, with philosophers, with high-ranking Buddhist priests, and spending time just developing arts, developing tea ceremony, developing flower arrangement, ink painting, gardening. And it was really just like a think tank of, of creative, spiritually minded people that were all sharing ideas, sharing each other's work. So all of these elements kind of started influencing one another. Yeah. So, when you asked about, you know, what's the kind of the relationship between the garden and the house, they're really evolving at the same times. So the house is really made to provide certain f literal framed viewpoints 
to make the garden appear as if it were a landscape painting. Right. And then the garden is planned in such a way to be viewed like that from the house. So it's much less like, let's build this beautiful house and then you know we'll throw in a landscape so it looks nice from the curb. Right. It's, it's really about this kind of homogenous art piece that's aware mm. um, of itself and of, of the other that it's around in. And I like to come into this room first. So right, it's like a garden and a house tour that mm -hmm. enters a completely, <laughs> seemingly empty, quiet space. But if we sit down here, um, the kind of austerity of this room um, very purposefully makes you aware of the pieces that are present. So we have this very soft light coming in through the shoji screen. Mm -hmm. um, that specifically is just kind of diffused and soft and gives an already kind of calming mood. And then it lights the objects in this room in such a way that kind of right, highlights their shadows, highlights their texture. Right. So now, you know, we can see this uh, tatami flooring um, that's very f finely woven and it's just like an incredible texture. Mm -hmm. uh, they completely shut off the world, but then you have just the small sort of light it. trickle. You got it. Yeah. hundred percent. Everything's subdued. You hear the trickle of the yeah. waterfall yeah. and then the murals. Yeah. Silent waterfall. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. I see that. It's almost like they did it on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but even with the slatted, like yeah, just, absolutely. just enough light coming absolutely. through. So you're not like in a total Absolutely. And Black when it's box. and if it's totally dark, yeah. Right, you see the handles on the on the doors, yeah. like they have that gold leaf around it. Yeah. And it's less for um, you know, showing off wealth per se, but it's actually because gold has like reflective qualities. And also in that a it's dark slightly time. indented so you could feel the difference dips in a little bit. Yeah. But it's like seventeenth century light switch that has the little LED inside where right. you can see it at night, but like right. it's the equivalent for that. Um, yeah, but it's totally subtle. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't notice it unless you spend a lot of time sitting in this room quiet. And we, yeah, we wouldn't notice it if there were guests here too. Right, so right, right, right. Thankful that you showed this to yeah. us also. I think um, what you could mm -hmm. also appreciate is that when you let a little less light in, mm -hmm. you have to pay attention to the subtleties of it. Mm -hmm. Exactly, you exactly. Know, it's, it's like, a, what are those chambers that you go into and they kind of take all oh, yeah, influences, sensory, sensory, sensory deprivation, deprivation <laughs> yeah. chambers, but you are mm -hmm. depriving of certain senses or you're, you're um, in a way, it's weird. It's kind of like you're, you're not dulling them, but you actually heighten, you like heighten them because of the subtle aspects of it. Absolutely. You know, so it, then you could appreciate that the elements of, you know, of the, flooring, you know, if you will, or even the subtle detailing here, exactly, which is just a, a slight deviation of the color and you can notice the patterning exactly. you know, at the end of the day, which you might not see if it's like full blown light coming out. Absolutely. On absolutely. And even just like the, the amount of time spent mm -hmm. sitting here quietly and you're like, you start to get into the headspace of, you know, the people hundreds of years mm -hmm. ago that, and, you know, I think that's an important part of like what we do here and what continues to be done in Japan is really just, you know, keeping those traditions going, but then also making sure that you you spend the time to really understand them and understand why the traditions are kept going. That then inspires you to yourself keep that tradition going for the next generation because, you know, there is so much value in it. Um, and I think, you know, from the American standpoint, there's there's almost this like unspoken idea of, you know, do something new, do something novel, like what's the next thing? Um, so, f you know, for me and for others that are working in this field here, it, I think for everyone there's probably an initial mental switch that needs to get done in terms of, you know, you don't have to constantly be innovating. And even within the, the art form, staying completely traditional, there's infinite possibility of how you can go about it. And it really has to do more with reading the space and reading the history of your own space and making decisions based on those things rather than cutting out your environment and just coming up with your own ideas for the sake of it.
coming through here. You can have the seat of honor, which is up here. <laughs> so I, I say that because, um, you know, this particular kind of structure really was built for the most kind of highest prestigious kind of person. So this is this is Japan's 17th century equivalent of like a mega mansion palace, basically. <laughs> um, so this entire room would really kind of be for one person, uh, whereas each of these kind of tatamis in a separate room for servants, you know, they would sleep one servant to a tatami and there could be, you know, Ten servants and then other room and just one here. And tell me what would uh, what would be the accoutrements here? Like, would it be very ascetic, or would there be, you know, musical instruments? Would there be? Yeah, you're essentially be... looking at it. Yeah. And that's kind of kind of the point. I mean, there's there's like cushions and futons, but all of those yeah. things would be kept away in storage and only really brought out as needed. But at that time, this kind of this idea of like austerity and purity and cleanliness and open space, specifically open space and even like nothingness, mm -hmm. were kind of like the ideas of, of the time, like the ideas of the elite, what they were thinking about. So that ultimately influenced what these buildings became to look like, you know, why there's this kind of like very soft um, off-white plaster, um, the specific grain of the wood not being, you know, overly naughty. Yeah. It's not overly interesting, but it has a, a subtle richness to it. Um, go what, ahead. What, a, what about that time in that history mm -hmm. lend, lent that way to this, of like this austerity and... I'd say that, you know, that's, like a, that's like a very big, like <laughs> socio-philosophical question about yeah. like an entire country. But yeah. like, if I were to have to kind of boil it down, I'd say that, you know, one, just like direct Zen Buddhist philosophy and like the practice of that and then just becoming the aesthetic um, manifestation of those ideas. But two, really kind of like a response to um, perhaps slightly earlier time periods where like extravagance and detail and like very complicated carvings, you know, gold leaf everywhere, kind of just like showing off you're showing off your wealth in a very obvious way, it kind of, you know, things often happen in reaction to the things that happened before. And I think uh, there were certain influential um, priests and monks who essentially said, you know what, like, I think we've gotten away from the way. And we're, we're kind of getting distracted by our things and our extravagance. And there's a little bit of irony there because like everything in this house and in this room is like incredibly expensive <laughs> and but it really comes more so not from the from the rarity of the material or the shininess but really like the craftsmanship right like someone someone has to weave this by hand right um, you know all of these pillars have to be hand cut out of a tree like you know before there was power tools yeah and there was uh, probably planes, some yeah. deep process to it because i know i've walked into like mm -hmm. some tea houses and they're like this this piece of wood needs to sit here like this for nine months, and then you know, yeah, yeah, like absolutely, this whole process, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Of this, yeah. At the time period, the idea was more so that all those things are hidden, like the complicatedness of it and the difficulty of it is hidden, but you know that it's there, and there's like a value in it being complicated, but also not showing it off, right? Which, yeah, it's just like super interesting. <laughs> there's more to see, but like this yeah. is it, you yeah. know? This is uh, because this is this is the main home. And this is where the main focus is. Yeah. Yeah. So essentially, um, this house was built mm -hmm. as a as a model. Both the house and the grounds were built mm -hmm. as what's called an insushi, mm -hmm. which is the rough translation is kind of like copy or replica, but it's not really the same meaning in terms of, you know, you didn't have your own idea, so you copied someone else's. It's right. more of like working within an established theme or like working in the honor of or like the spiritual influence of. So it was made as an utsushi of a building um, called Kojoin, uh, which is at a temple complex uh, outside of Kyoto. Um, and that was built in like 1603. So the particular layout of, of the house and of the garden is really kind of like based off of those ideas. And then really specifically with the garden is kind of readapted to the actual location that it's landed in. Mm -hmm. But at that garden, uh, it's probably 
one fifth of this size, mm -hmm. and you can't go in. Like mm. you, you never go in. That's not part of the experience. Like the entire garden yeah. is coming in here, sitting where we are, yeah. and looking here. Right. And the idea is like this garden really symbolizes all of nature, mm -hmm. even like the universe per se. You know, depending on on who you talk to. Right. And the idea is like. It's kind of the same way that I'm like talking about the tatami, right? Yeah. Like there's a, just like an incredible depth or, in the texture of you this. You know, even somebody might take this as like these are the the dunes or the sand or you know right, the, the right. way that because when I think about kind of Japanese gardening mm -hmm. or landscape design, like some of the things that I feel or hear that you might be getting towards is like when, with that microcosm, like mm -hmm. this is a little microcosm. It's it's um, it's like you said, not a replica, but it's taking on you know, if you see faraway mountains, they're trying to recreate those mountains, but maybe on a smaller scale with the boulders, you know, yeah, in a way. Yeah, exactly. So it's Absolutely. just, it's almost like a little diorama, right. if you will, and of the larger landscape. And it's this idea landscape. that it's, you know, what you have is enough. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you're extremely wealthy, like this, this would be a big garden for the upper 1%, you know? Obviously there's like very big stroll gardens for like emperors and things like that, but like in terms of your average huge estate garden like this is big mm -hmm. but the idea is like all of the elements are here in the same way that like in a dry garden where it's just gravel and a few stones all of those ideas they're still there we're just representing it with kind of more pieces the um, other element too is that it's meticulously kept mm -hmm. up and even when looking at the way where the water's placed or how odd that tree might look Mm -hmm. You know, even the growth structures, right, mm -hmm. have some meaning or something that's interesting to look at. Yeah, and for this specific garden, it's it's really supposed to be like, you know, this pond is kind of just like the ocean, mm -hmm. uh, the ocean in general, um, right? Any of these stones, they could possibly be like a, a ship or, you know, I small islands popping up along the way. That particular island with the pine on it, that's actually like a, a turtle island, which is like a very old motif. And the idea is that, you know, a turtle can live 10,000 years. And this sounds like fantastical, but the tree is supposed to be the tail of the turtle. And the average person thinks to themselves, well, like, that's not what turtle tails look like. What are you talking about? But the idea is that the turtle has been swimming in the ocean for so long that it's kind of picked up seaweed and debris and like moss and other growth that it's kind of having its own its own mi little microcosm, microcosm on, on its yeah, tail. on its back and um, yeah, tail and barnacles so like the, everywhere. The, yeah. the, older, the older the turtle, the like bigger its tail would be. So that's often represented with a pine tree. And even breaking it down like even further, the like turtle is this symbol of the north. Mm -hmm. And like the head of the turtle faces the north side of the garden. Mm -hmm. And then there's all these different kind of elements that you can go like more and more specific. Yeah, the symbolism mm -hmm, is so mm -hmm, deep. Mm -hmm. It's like re reading um, Murakami or whatever. I always feel like when I read uh, a Murakami novel or whatever, I'm like, I'm not getting as as the as deep a level of symbolism as I know that is probably in one of these yeah. books. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> you know? And but, it, it totally depends on the kind of garden, right? So like yeah. the very old gardens, especially if they have um, kind of like records of, of the ideas that went behind them, like very old gardens from like 800 years ago there's like very 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 specific like this particular stone means exactly this particular kind of thing and over time it started to kind of get not diluted but that kind of took a, a secondhand role to like the overall kind of just like balance and artfulness of the garden like the way that it makes it feel so it became a little bit less pedantic with you know you have to have this kind of lantern in this exact particular mm -hmm. place and more just like painting a landscape that does kind of read as this overall microcosm. Right. Things. There's things in Japanese gardens that you always tend to see. The lantern you had mm -hmm. mentioned, a waterfall, a bridge. Mm -hmm. What are certain elements that you would like, pay attention to, they say, that you would say, this is something that is actually symbolic in just about every Japanese garden. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think an obvious place to start would be like the waterfall. Mm -hmm. And like I said before, like not every waterfall like means the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. And this one's like a classic Buddhist triad, three tier waterfall that was present in many kind of like archetypal Japanese gardens. So like I mentioned, when they built this house, they really wanted to make like the quintessential Japanese house. And then the idea was also to have a kind of like quintessential 
Japanese garden. Even though it's not actually separated from the rest of the garden mm -hmm. in an obvious way, the idea that there's this waterfall here and this kind of like buildup of shrubbery plants, mm -hmm. that's really supposed to be like um, Mount Horai, which is like the, the mountain of the immortals or like island of the immortals. And it really is just like representing, yeah, like paradise or like some kind of like ultimate harmony mm -hmm. in life. And like, you'll notice like we can't get over there yeah. physically, yeah. but it's still here for you yeah. in a way. And like, even, you know, sitting back there and mm -hmm. contemplating the space, you realize that like, you know, that's like a spiritual journey that you make. It's not a, it's mm -hmm. not a physical one, but at the same time, understanding that it's part of your actual landscape, mm -hmm. like it's here in Philadelphia, it's right there with materials that you know, it's like, it's this clue that like, that's within reach, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So like, to me, that's so much more powerful than being able to like tramp over there and be like, look, you know, I'm on top of there. <laughs> I've it's, the like, yeah, it's like, it's like, no, like, appreciate what that distance is like giving you, right. you know? Um, but yeah, I mean, in that particular case, right, like these are just, really big old eastern white pines that aren't really like a classical Japanese pine tree to include. But, you know, understanding the indigenous to here history of that tree, of it being like a symbolic tree of life. Exactly. Yeah, that needs to stay on, <laughs> on the island of the immortals. Mm -hmm. Like that's that's 100% completely on brand. Well, these yeah, these mm -hmm. are the choices that a gardener will make, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm you might have like the pines that typically would come from Japan, but mm -hmm. their influence was their surrounding landscape. You exactly, know, your influence exactly. is this surrounding landscape. Exactly. And if a uh, pinus strobus is, <laughs> right. you know, native to the area, then that is your surrounding landscape Absolutely. Right, at the end of the day. So I, I feel like there's that, that luxury of um, the artist's palette mm -hmm. that he or she can create for themselves. And so, I could go with it. Yeah, 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 totally. I could go with it. And it's also like, right, it's like keeping it within bounds. Because at the end of the day, right, this particular garden was meant to be a kind of like quintessential and classic mm -hmm. space. So there's a, there's a way of thinking about Japanese gardening that would be like based completely on indigenous plants. And, you know, even kind of taking in like local or our, your own historical kind of attitude. And even though it wouldn't be like Japanese, it still would be like getting to the core of those mm -hmm. ideas. And in a different location, like what I would think would be like what to do in 2022, like would be very different than what we do here. Yeah. But like, I didn't make this place mm -hmm. and other people did and it's here. And like the house is setting such a specific precedent that like we have to work within that. Um, and like, even though it can't be exactly like Japan, it doesn't need to be, but like, it can't be like fully just like 2022 either. Right. So like, you know, that's why like, they made the decision to have the Federal Island here with the like, Mount Hurai with the waterfall. And it's like, okay, <laughs> we need to work, we need right. to work in that particular direction. Yeah, but sometimes it's <laughs> good to have the boundaries, you know, of this. And this is really the boundary of it. And I always wonder like when I walk into mm -hmm you know, kind of a Japanese garden and they have, you know, the the rock garden, the dry garden, yep. they have this and that. But those a lot of those are from different time periods, yes, right? Yes, yes. So how do you, how do you, how does one experience this place? Like, is it from a specific period? Are you meant to see the different periods? Are you meant to travel through the different yeah, periods? Yeah, yeah, so that's an excellent question. And like, right, there isn't any rule. And that's kind of like, one of my favorite things to talk about, like, if someone doesn't know anything, right, you have to talk about, like, Japanese gardening. But, yeah. like, really what Japanese gardening is, is, like, its own entire world that has all these different styles, these different yeah. time periods, even, you know, there's top Japanese garden scholars that completely disagree about things. So certain gardens, you know, they will have, you know, this section of the garden was built in, like, 1450 by XYZ head priest. And then you turn the corner and it's like a different kind of time period. Um, other ones are like all built at the same time or they'll only kind of have one section. Here, right, the idea was to have a viewing garden that was completely pure viewing garden. And there was totally the option to make it a strolling garden, which I think, you know, the average person would maybe think they wanted. Mm -hmm. But there was a very specific decision made to be like, 
have it be a viewing garden that you can't go into, mm -hmm. and then that's going to be the experience point and the right. learning point. Right. Um, and then also, we'll make our way around the corner, which we can we can do yeah, now probably. Yeah, let's do that. Um, is to the tea garden area, which is here. So, if that experience there is com mm -hmm. is completely visual, and almost like spiritual, the idea of the tea garden is very much experiential. It's not really like representing this big portrait of the universe or anything. It's really meant to be where you are right then in that moment. And it has its own aesthetics to it. You'll notice like it's a little bit less kind of like formal or arranged. Uh, we have, these haven't leafed out yet obviously, but it's like a much kind of shadier, darkier place. There's more of uh, the kind of undulation in terms of the grading. And it's supposed to give you this kind of like feeling that you're in a kind of like a, a forested thicket or in the kind of mountainside. And the whole point of this particular garden, and we'll, we can make that procession, but just talking about it from up here, the idea is that you make the procession and slowly going through that procession, entering into this kind of quote informal space that's mountainous. It's supposed to kind of like humble your mind, slow down your energy as you're making your way into the tea house and by the time you get there you've like solemned yourself to to get your mind ready for accepting tea and being in the tea room so it's very much about taking those particular steps and the stepping stones are arranged in such a way that you have to pay attention to where you're going the, even the spacing of them mm -hmm. you'll notice it's like kind of closer so yeah. if you're walking at full speed, you won't actually fall on each step. Right. But if you go slowly, you it, the stones kind of set their own pace for you. Um, what I've also learned, like when going into a tea house, they always have doors that are quite short. Yes. Right. So that you bend and yes, humble yes. nature before you go into the tea. And you had mentioned even just the journey of getting there. Totally. It's supposed to humble you. Totally. And the interesting thing about our tea house is that. It's uh, once again, it's a utsushi of an older tea house called Masudoku Seki. Um, at like a, yeah, it's like an <laughs> older temple in Kyoto. Um, but that particular tea house doesn't have a crouching door to the same degree. And, you know, why that particular decision was made, like perhaps we'll never know. People have kind of like made arguments that, uh, it was just so like people didn't hit their head at MoMA. <laughs> but, like, but like that particular tea house, yeah, I think it's like from uh, late 1600s. Um, but it's still, it's still like a crouching door. It's just not, you know, the tiny little square. Uh, but, you know, when we go in there, you'll see like it's, it's very, it's very co cozy. Yeah. Um, but once again, that's, that space was made for the absolute upper tier of society so it's not like they couldn't afford a bigger room it's that there's an intentional decision for that small intimate space as you've walked through this garden to like give you a particular feeling that they wanted as the setting for tea ceremony a very unofficial setup <laughs> so i hope um no tea ceremony masters are watching this i'm actually going to move that flower arrangement okay. um, So, uh, right, regarding the specificity of things, this is a, a chabana, uh, which basically means like tea flower arrangement. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's done in a particular style that's supposed to be undistracting for the, for the tea ceremony. So it always has just three elements and is always maximal simple, and then it's meant to be displayed mm -hmm. specifically in that tokenoma area there. Mm -hmm. Is this also um, clay walls, or what are the yeah, walls? Yeah, so these are these are plaster walls, and mm -hmm. then the bottom strip here, yeah. those are washi paper. You'll notice that on this strip here, uh, that's wider. Yeah. Um, that's to demarcate the, the guest area, and it's it's really to kind of like keep the wall clean from people's kimono brushing, brushing against it. Oh, I see. Whereas here, the lower white, this is the, the tea master's area. So Fascinating. The, the preparation room is the one back in here. Yeah. Um, whereas guests would only ever enter through that, through that front Fascinating. room. Fascinating. And then the, the color of the wall is actually chosen to like kind of give off the subtle hint of matcha. 
Um, so it has that like green kind of mixed into it. Wow. But, yeah, it's like. And then you have thatched, like a thatch, almost like a basket weaving roof. Totally, but yeah. there's three different roofs in here. Yeah. Um, and they're specifically kind of meant to represent like different levels of formality, um, or like shin being the most formal, so being the most informal, and then gyo kind of being in between the two. So this one would be kind of like shin, where it's like a very like repeated pattern with a very um, regular uh, material. And then here we just have a plain single board. So that would, in my opinion, would be like the so, because it's just a single board. And the only thing that you see is that grain. Because you eliminated all of the other um, you know, patterning or stuff to it, you notice that like in that grain, there's like that infinite complexity of the universe just mm -hmm. like happening within the grain. And then, of course, here we have the wood grain with the bamboo. Um, and even those like the smaller strips of bamboo are like smoked and occasionally, you know, they'll be like salvaged from a, like a different temple that burned down and it's like using a piece from like a different history. This particular post here that's demarcating that room, you know, the bark is left on yeah. and that's supposed to kind of give off this rustic vibe, <laughs> basically. Mm -hmm. um, that's part of the kind of the feeling of tea ceremony and compared to the other room that we were just in, you'll notice like all of these beams are not squared. Mm -hmm. They're just peeled of bark. You can see the knots. And even the arrangement of the room, like different sections will like hit at different points. Like that's actually taller mm -hmm. um, than this area. The windows are asymmetrical, but yeah. then this tiny room, you know, it's, it's made to be that way so that when we enjoy the tea, once again, your senses are like focused in you know, on that room and that procession that we did. Mm -hmm. um, same deal, it's supposed to kind of like slow your mind to get you ready to take in these kind of like subtle flavors and nuances and everything. So I'm using my very traditional yeah. <laughs> tea pouring element, but we'll add some water. And what's this? Is this like a ginger? Or so like that's that's yokon. Okay. It's a it's like a old school simple um, tea sweet. Mm -hmm. um, so Tea will be served. What uh, is it made from? It's made from uh, uh, sugar and mm -hmm. agar agar. Okay. The seaweed. Yeah, the seaweed. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's vegan and gluten free. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and a little bit of uh, green tea powder. That as might well. actually have been the funniest thing element of this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> vegan, gluten free, cruelty free. <laughs> uh, this is a cha sense mixer, but yeah, this definitely this isn't a tea ceremony, but. Um, at the end of the day, really what, what tea is about um, is just making tea and sharing it with, with, with friends and yeah. ex experiencing um, that together. And so I, can, I need to turn it up. If anyone's watching this, they're going to be like, he's making that too slow. <laughs> this is just a recreation. <laughs> <laughs> it's not meant to be so formal. I just got one of these for the house. <laughs> the making of those is like, Incredible. Oh, is it really? Yeah, I've. It, oh, I'd love to see that. a single piece of bamboo, so yeah, it's like totally classic um, tea ceremony philosophy, where it's like a very simple material that's accessible to anyone, and the value really comes from the you know the craftsmanship and the ordinariness of it. So it's it's a single piece of bamboo that's shaved down and then split into really fine hairs and wow. then separated with uh, that small cord. Wow. I've tried making them before and it's um, I broke more times than I successfully. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll try again. I'll try again. Perseverance. Yeah. So, so yeah, we'll have we'll have the sweet first. Okay. Um, so that's typically how it's done then. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you kind of wet the whistle with the sugar first <laughs> and then. But yeah, in Japan, you know, this this really kind of came about as a meditation aid hmm. initially was using using matcha to kind of stay awake to help during, you know, long meditation sessions because um, the caffeine just like... Yeah, buzzes you. Yeah. Um, and also make me go to the bathroom really quickly. So yeah. <laughs> you need to know where the bathroom is. Um, there, there's, <laughs> traditionally, there's, there's always a... Um, outdoor privy yeah. uh, as part of the, the tea ceremony complex. So <laughs> they have you covered. They had that same problem. Huh? Exactly. Yeah. 
It's a diuretic. Yeah. <laughs> You know what I mean, though? Like, you take a sip, and yeah. you're in the room sitting down, and you're like, I get it now. Yeah. I know you're filming, but you got to get in on it while it's warm. <laughs> I know, do you have a cold Man, matcha? We're all, we're all in the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you could set it down and still film. Oh, it doesn't have the base. You have to have your little sugary thing first. <laughs> These are some skills, though. Mm-hmm. Not too sweet, right? No, not yeah. at all, actually. It'd be distracting. Yeah, it, it would be. I was also going to ask, is mm -hmm. there, like, a specific tempo of drinking your matcha? Like, do you... Is it just, like, a however many gulps you do it in, or like before it gets to a little too cool? Or? Totally, so like, uh, as I mentioned, right, like this is just, this is like, you came over Sandy's house and, you, and he threw some matcha in the yeah. microwave for you, yeah. equivalent. <laughs> but like, in Japan, there's all these different tea schools that have um, their own methodology of how they go about things, uh, the specific movements, right? You might, one school might pick up the bowl, turn it three times, and another school might be like, no, you're supposed to turn it four times. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, that part doesn't really matter. It's mm -hmm. more about the idea of practicing the particular kind of choreography, if you will, mm -hmm. of serving the tea and receiving the tea enough times that you don't have to think about what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And then that allows you to be fully sensory aware because you're not questioning, like, did I pick this up right? You know... Is it going to be the right temperature? Like all those things are pre-figured out, mm -hmm. and that's the point of practice. Mm. So that when it comes time for the actual ceremony, you're like you're just in it because it's it's already hardwired. Mm. And so you know, like I've never even truly fully experienced it because I haven't studied enough to to be able to completely turn my awareness or like self-awareness off. Um, but there's, you know, there's still something to be said about, you know, just sharing tea. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, the, that practice is still very much alive and well today, like 400 years later. Yeah. Um, so that's pretty amazing, right? And like, kind of jumping back into that, like, idea of progress. It's like, yeah, like, if people haven't changed it for 400 years, like, why should I be the one to change it? It's like, maybe I shouldn't be, you know? <laughs> uh, but there's there's just so much value in, in, in practicing something and practicing something established and only really making changes when they're like absolutely necessary or it makes sense to or you're like called to change it by reality um and then other than that like finding the value and what other people found value before mm.